It's time for us to get into the Word of God. Thank you, worship team. You have done an incredible job. Can we give a huge round of applause for them? All right. Let's dive right into God's Word. We've been diving through, diving through. I said that word 17 times already. We have been going through, walking through the book of Colossians most people have been doing this every day for the past few weeks. Um, we've been jumping in and learning so much. And there is such a rich book. I've got to admit, I didn't spend a lot of time like this focused in one particular book like this for a while. We did it with Ephesians last year, but I love it when you can just dive into one book, make it your focus, try and draw out what it is that's going on. And last, the first week we looked at the, the, the phrase for over all of this series is Jesus over everything. Colossians 1.16, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Paul places emphasis right here at the beginning of this book uh, on Christ is in all, through all, above all. Christ is the all in all. He is everything that you need. He is all. Um, as I was reading this, I was drawn also to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Everyone say, all things. And by your will they were created and have their being. You know, we've got to remember that this book was um, to address some um, heresies that were being perpetuated in the church in Colossians, the three heresies that we, we talked about in week one, Gnostic mysticism, which is trying to chase after a higher knowledge. There's levels in this thing, and we can just get to a, a higher knowledge. There's also asceticism, which is the body is corrupt and must be punished, and I have to treat myself harshly in order for God to accept me and like me. And then religious legalism trying our best personally to fulfill the law that was fulfilled in Christ. People still living in that old way. And then week two, we looked at turning misery into mission. Ah, oh, I love that, that message, turning misery into message. Paul was, is it okay if the pastor says, I love that message? Is that, are we allowed to do that? Just whatever. Yeah. Paul's writing this from prison, but still accepts that his mission is to find the joy in the midst of the suffering. He's been beaten, shipwrecked, abused. He's been in threat from every single angle, but he finds joy. This is my joy that I could actually be here instead of you. So how much of that translates to what we're going through right now? We've got to find joy in the suffering. You know, we're called to a mission, but often we are unwilling to sacrifice our calling for comfort. Did I say that right? Yeah. We're unwilling to sacrifice comfort for calling. Sorry, I said it the wrong way around. <laughs> it's all right. Preachers make mistakes too. It's okay. Week three, last week, we talked about believers beware, and we talked about all the different warning signs that there are in this, watching out for empty philosophies, religious legalism, and man-made disciplines. They are all worthless outside of Jesus Christ, which brings us to the theme for this message. We're going to be diving into chapter three, uh, and we're going to see you know, how we go, but there's so much in this passage. I've got a feeling that we might have to extend this series and, and keep going in Colossians, but let's just see how we go. But have you ever gotten up and gotten dressed in the morning? Have you ever sort of walked out of the, the bedroom into the living room, or have you ever left the house and gone down the street and been, you've looked in your wardrobe and you've put something on, and you're like, oh, gee, this is pretty fly. Um, I'm, I'm looking pretty good today. And you walk down the street and you're standing there and somebody you know, somebody who loves you, somebody who cares deeply about you, looks at you intently and says, what are you wearing? I don't know about you, but this happens to me more often than not. I definitely know it happens to Pastor Greg. Yep. Uh, and it may have even happened on a Sunday. I, I don't remember, know if you remember, but you know, there's been a few Sundays around and Pastor Greg's pretty daring when it comes to fashion. I'd say he's a, he's a leader when it comes to... He's fashion forward. Um, but what are you wearing? And that is the title of the message today. What are 
you wearing? You know, normally for me, it's Rachel or the girls will look at my ensemble and they will go, what are you wearing? And, you know, I've I've had that question quite a number of times. For Jude Borlase, it's, you know, when it's got slides and socks on, people come up and say, what are you wearing, Jude? You know, but people can often look at us and go, what are you wearing? You know, it's good to have friends like that. Friends that care about you are friends to your future. You know, then care enough about us to speak into our fashion choices, choices. But what about someone who is prepared to speak into your life, challenge what is wrong and tell you to go back into the room and get changed? What about that? What about having someone who's honest enough to be able to speak to you and say something's not right with what's going on with you. You need to go back into the room and get changed. We, um, we were chatting recently with some friends of ours who are putting, the, you know, they're arranging for their, their dad to go into a retirement village and nursing home and his sister was you know, visiting with the dad and had decided that she needed to have a look at his, his closet and see, see what clothes there because the dad would always wear the same shirts. I mean, and we're not just talking about for a year, we're talking about for decades, the same clothes. And there would be rips in them and maybe a few stains and it'd be a bit dirty and, um, and they, they out, outdated, they weren't fresh clothing. They, you know, it wasn't kept up to speed, it was stained, it was damaged, it was worn. The clothing that he was wearing was worn. But when she went into his closet to get some clothing for, you know, when they went to the retirement village, she realized that he had been given over a number of decades brand new clothes that were still in the packets left in the closet that he had never pulled out, but he continued to wear the same clothes. What are you wearing? You know, today I think it's time for us to dive into a Christian makeover. We need to be looking at changing our clothes when it comes to our mind, when it comes to our heart, and when it comes to our future. You know, I think this passage of scripture, and we're going to jump into it in just a minute, can be separated into a number of different ways, but can be a few sections. How do we live a Christ-centered life? How do we dress? How do we treat family? How do we treat everybody else? But I want to focus us today around this topic about how do we dress as Christians? How do we dress as believers? And there's a few things that we need to, to look at. This, this whole chapter is about what we take off and what we put on. It's time to change our clothes. I had some discussions with the family about what do we call this message. Um, you know, there were some suggestions that I had that didn't make it past the approval stage. So we're going with this what are you wearing? What are you wearing? If you're writing down a title, write this down. And I think that as Christians, we need to clothe ourselves differently. There's a few things that we're going to go through today that we need to clothe ourselves in. And the first one is this, we need to be clothed in glory. Let's have a look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. We are clothed in glory. Since then, and just remember, just at the end of last week, we talked about how we were dead with Christ. We were buried with Christ. It says, starts in verse 1, Since then you have been raised with Christ and set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. You know, there is now a different way of living. We no longer live in the same way. Now, you've got to understand the context of this book is written to the church in Colossae, right? It's not written to the church in Jerusalem, which was very different. So if we, if we look at it, this church in Jerusalem was raised on scriptural foundations, was raised on the Torah, was raised on the law, was raised on following the rules and the regulations. They had all of this background they could actually draw from to understand where they're going next. The church in Colossae had none of that. They had paganism. They had all of this stuff that they, that they used to do, they used to live, and now it's time for Paul's going, it's time for you to actually change your life. We've got to stop acting the same way. Why? Why? 
that since at the end of chapter 2 we are now dead to the spiritual forces of the world, why do we keep acting as though we belong to the dead? Why, since we now have a new wardrobe full of brand new clothes, are we still wearing the old, torn, smelly, dirty rags that we maybe feel comfortable in? You know, sometimes when you get a new shirt out of its packet, it sort of feels a little bit itchy to start with, or it might not feel a bit comfortable. You know, a couple of washes and some fabric softener will fix that. But we often go, well, this shirt's just comfortable to me. I, I just, I, I'm used to this. This is, this is what I do. This is, this, is who, this is who I am. This is who I am. And we don't want to put on the new, uncomfortable, stiff, starched clothing that needs to be ironed and pressed. We don't want to put that on because we, we're comfortable in, in what we've got. We've got our, our trackies and our stained jumper and we're happy just to sit on the couch and spill cheesels all over ourselves. And, and I'm, I'm okay like this. I'm not, in, I'm not impacting anybody else. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not hurting anybody else. I, I'm just, this, is, this is just me. You know? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And you're dusting crumbs off your shoulder. You know, why do we keep acting as though we belong to the dead? Now, at the outset of Colossians, we find there's a different way of living, different thinking. Paul continues, he puts this into two different key statements. Set your heart and set your mind. Set your heart and set your mind. Both of these directed on things above. Why is he separating those two things out? Because those are the two separate things that are in conflict constantly. Our mind and our heart are quite often in conflict when it comes to spiritual matters. Our head often gets in the road of where our heart needs to be. But we need to line both of these things up. And Paul says right here in the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, set your heart and set your mind on things above. It's a different way of living. It's a different way of thinking. You can change it. You know, you've got to realize that you are no longer located here in earth, but in heaven. That's your destination. That's your new postcode. Your address is located in heaven in eternity. It's no longer located in the temporal things, but in the eternal things. And we need to realize that that's our new location. Let's consider what Paul is really saying. He says, now that we have died to ourselves, we are alive in Christ who made us alive. We are located in him, by him, and for him. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I understand some of these scriptures may not appear up on the screen for those of you who are playing at home, but write them down. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. What we have doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. It all belongs to God. Everything from creation, from the foundations to our image, everything that you see, it belongs to God. It's got God's ownership over it. It all belongs to him. So in this passage, Paul is calling us to a higher standard, higher way of thinking. Stop being dragged back into the mud, muck of the world and set your heart and mind on Jesus Christ. He reminds us continually that the old way our way has died and we are now brought together in Christ Jesus and we are made alive in him. We are located in him. But not only that, we get to be placed and located in glory with him. In glory. It says there right at the end of that first chapter, um, verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So let's have a look at what that word means glory actually means. The word glory is the word doxa. It literally means a place of high honor. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? Like, oh, hey, we're going to get a high honor. We're going to you know, be placed in, the, oh, I'm going to be seated. I'm going to have this position. It's all about, oh, wow, this is awesome. I get this place of high honor. You know what? But actually in this instance, the, the word's not referring to a place of high honor. We've got to learn to read the scriptures right, dive back into the actual meanings. We can't just make it mean whatever we want it to mean. But in this passage here, Paul is referring to the word glory as brightness. 
brightness. And glory literally means the quality of emitting beautiful and bright light, often referred to the transcendent nature, reflective especially of God's nature. So God, through Jesus, he says, take your dirty, stained, ripped, worthless rags and clothe yourself in glory. So what does that look like? Rachel, you want to pass me what we've got here today? It looks a little bit like this. Glory, I would assume, is the high vis of heaven. We've got to put on our high vis. We've got to put on glory. Glory is where God has situated us. It is given us. It is brightness. And we are meant to shine and reflect. It says there that the, the literally, this is what it means. It says, often referring to the transcendent nature, reflective, especially of God's nature, beautiful and bright light. We are called to reflect God's light to the world. So we've got to put on the high vis of heaven. You know, what you wear often reflects who you belong to, right? If you're wearing normally in the street, if you see someone walking down the street and they're wearing high vis, what would you assume? They're a tradie. That's right, they're a tradie. Either we're, or they're just wanting to be a tradie. Oh, who knows? They're, <laughs> tradie tryhards, I don't know. But I can't wear high vis because I'm, I'm not a tradie. I've got a different trade. But I don't, I don't wear high vis all the time. I've just got it on today. But you would see that. But if you see someone who is wearing all black with black hair and has got pale skin, what would you assume? A te- <laughs> yes, they could be a techie. Ron, that's great. They could be a techie. But you, know, you might assume that they are a goth or an emo. You know, what you wear often reflects where you are located and who you belong to. You know what? Your clothing is linked to your identity. So is your spiritual clothing. Your spiritual clothing is linked to your identity and we are clothed in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. But we are also, take this one off, clothed in righteousness. We are clothed in righteousness. I love when I just be able to throw stuff around the building. It's great. Clothed in righteousness. And for this example, I had to take off the bright, shining one and... I would have worn white jeans today, but I don't have them for a specific reason because the girls would say, what are you wearing? Um, But we need to be putting on righteousness. We need to be acting a certain way and putting on certain things. And when the Bible talks to us about righteousness is that God has made us right by his sacrifice, by sending Jesus to the cross to wash us clean as white as snow, which is why I'm wearing this white shirt today to impact and reflect on righteousness. The Christian life, it's a journey. We know that instantly when we receive Jesus Christ that we are forgiven and we are washed clean. The slate is brand new and we are spotless before God because of what Christ has done. Oh, that sounds like a mic drop moment and just walk off. That's it. We're all done and dusted here. But it doesn't end there, does it? It's a journey. You know, when you first got saved, you were like, this is amazing. Jesus has cleansed me. He has washed me new. But then you got home and you're like, but there's still these things that I do. There's still these things that I I don't feel right about anymore. There's this stuff that I used to live and and it it feels kind of mucky now. This process of righteousness and becoming sanctified is a journey. We, with this behaviors, attitudes, lifestyle that now need to conform to the image of Christ. Let's look at Colossians 3, verses 5. We're going to go all the way to 17. It says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath or wrath, Wrath or wrath, put it in the chat, which is it, wrath or wrath. And look, if you think I say it wrong, you've got to blame Veggie Tales, okay? Because that's how I get it, wrath, wrath. This is, this is going back to grow from last, last year, or earlier this year. Wrath or wrath, which is it? Put it in the chat. I don't know how you're going to put that in the chat because they're both spelled the same way. All right, just put it in the chat anyway. The wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now, now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. And just, I want you to self-assess right now. Anger, rage, malice, slander, 
and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, vaccinated or unvaccinated, but Christ is all and is in all. Now, I apologise for anyone who thinks I might be adding to the scripture there, but I'm actually doing a creative licence. I'm not trying to add to the scripture, but what you can see here is we're going to talk about division in just a moment. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Whoa, hang on, Paul. You're out of line. How, this, we've, got to, we've, we've got all this frustration and we've just got to get it out. No, be patient. Bear with each other and forgive one another if you have a grievance against someone. Okay? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. I love how that little sentence stands by itself. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing unto God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. I feel like that's just the message right there. That We could probably just read that a couple of times and be done with the rest of this. I want, I want to pull a couple of things out of this. But I think as an exercise, as Christians, if we want to work out how we should behave, how we should act, especially because we know we're an example to the world, it's probably right there. It's a process. It's a journey. You know, since we've taken off our old self with our practice and we put on the new self, which is being renewed. So let's have a look at what the being renewed, that the key term here is being, not has been, not it's finished. No, no, this is a process. This is continual. Being. We are being renewed and made new. And as we look through this passage, it's all about taking off old behaviors, putting on new ones. This right here is the shopping spree. All right? And I just immediately saw all the ladies in the room, their heads just went up like this. What? Shopping spree? Please? It's like squirrel. Squirrel. Shopping spree. Imagine getting given like a gift card or a shopping spree where you could go to your favorite store and you could just run around with a trolley and just fill it with all the brand new stuff that you want. Anything you like, clothes, jackets, shoes. Who would be heading straight for the, the sports shoe section, the Jordans that I'd be heading there. New jeans. Some maybe, maybe some people are needing to go to the, the underpants aisle. I don't know. Get some new socks, whatever. Anything you like. But what would you choose when you went there? Would you go, oh, Maybe, the, maybe if I went to this store and it's all for free and I could get what is new, what, what is brand new, maybe there's the second-hand department down there. Maybe there's something that's a little bit more like what I've been wearing or that's a bit comfortable and torn. Would, would you go for the brand new? Would you get the clean? Would you get the new? Would you go for the old? Paul's saying here, your old clothes stink. It's time to go shopping and here's a list of what the things you should choose from. It's like... I don't know, guys, have you ever gone to the shops and your wife has given you instructions, can you just get stuff for dinner? I don't know about you, but I find that very unhelpful. I'm like, I don't want you to tell me what, just get stuff for dinner. I want you to tell me exactly the things on the list that you need so that when I get home, you're not going to get angry with me for not getting something that wasn't on the list in the first place. Paul is giving us a list of shopping. He says, go and buy these things. Go and get these things. Ray Steadman says, Paul is saying that we are continually remember who we are now, who we once were but no longer are, and who we will be when Christ returns. This is the true basis for living a Christian life. Scripture calls it walking with the Lord. And there's a few different instructions in this passage, and man, I have got so much jammed into this. This is going to be like a 17-part series now. It says the first, first instruction that we need to put off, sexual immorality. 
You know, we looked at the context of the church location. Colossae was not Jerusalem. It was not raised in the same way. They didn't have the same foundations, the same things you should do and not do. Colossae was a free-for-all. You live your own way. Paganism, sexual immorality was part of their worship. This is definitely different. It's a secular pagan society without the same history of religious instruction. And this would have been prevalent in the culture, all sorts of sexual immorality. And what he's saying here is that what you used to find acceptable is now no longer acceptable. Anger and malice is the things that come out from our lips. What, what is coming out from our lips? Proverbs has got a lot to say about the power of the tongue. Um, Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Matthew 12, 34 says, The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You know, you can either speak life or you can speak death. You can bring peace or you can bring fear. You can get on Facebook and jump up and down all you like and bring your opinion. But what are you building? What are you building? Lying. Do not lie to each other. This is what you used to do. But don't be a part of it any longer. We can't lie to each other. And this is the big one, I think. This one here, I think, is pretty key because I never really reflected too closely on this until just recently. Colossians 3.11 says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Here's the point. Your background, location, religious upbringing, social status or financial freedom do not give you a higher place in the kingdom. We're all one with Christ. In fact, he says that Christ is all and is in all. He is all. Christ is all. You know, it's really hard to talk about this without talking about the elephant in the room. You know, we all see, we all know, the government's trying to separate people based on a status, based on a decision, based on a forced or unforced decision, whatever you want to look at it. They're trying to divide people based on this. They're pitting families, partners, colleagues, friends against each other. We can't afford to allow, that, allow us to play into their hands. We can't afford it. What Christ says is that it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you are clean or unclean. Who I am and what I have done covers it all and makes you one. So I'm defensive about this and I'm passionate I will not allow for the division and the schism to come between us because unity is far more important. What did we say before? A divided world needs a united church and we need to be united right now. We can't allow division to come in. So instead of all of these things we need to put off, there are some new clothes that we need to put on. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Okay, just read that and just do that. That's, I mean, as a pastor, um, I can't explain things much simpler than this. You, you can go in, oh, let's dive in. What does the scripture actually really mean? Just read that. Just be that. Do that. If you want to know how you can improve and, and, and be closer with God and, and be a better Christian and, and take a step on your journey, just do that. That right there. Um, I've got so much more. But can, George, would you mind just coming in, playing keys? I looked over here, but you're over there. Um, I want to wrap this up by just diving into something I, I, I read late last night. I, um, I was lying in bed and I was reading John Maxwell's Leadership Bible. And I try to read from a number of different sources from Colossians and different versions and different translations. And something that John Maxwell wrote, which is a leadership thought, uh, which is leadership thought in a Sunday service. Yes, we're going to go there. All right. And I just wanted to just wrap this up. So I want people who are paying attention with your phone or with your your notepad or however you're taking notes to just write some of these things down and it's from a section called self-discipline the battle belong begins in the mind the battle begins in the mind paul argues that since we have a new position we need to get a new perspective 
Permanent change and improvement are always happening from the inside out. Consider this Paul's prescription for self-discipline. So here they are. Number one, we need to remember our identity. We need to remember whose we are and where we belong and where we're located. We've got focus first on our position in Christ. It all starts there. The second thing is that we need to renew our thought life. Renew our thought life. We've got to focus our minds on things above. We've got to raise new internal standards. Third thing is that we need to recognize that our old life is dead. Bear with me. Why, if it's dead, why do we spend so much time, effort, and energy trying to resurrect it? We do. We spend so much time trying to resurrect the, oh, if only I, I can improve on this. I can make this better. I can do this myself. No, you can't. It's dead. And it is buried with Christ in the new one. New person is raised. Change doesn't happen if in maintain any way to return to old patterns. Cut them off. Number four, release past habits. We must put off the old like taking off a worn out set of clothes. Like I said before with our friends up in Sydney. And then the fifth and final thing is that we have to replace those habits with new ones. We get rid of old habits only when we substitute new habits for them. Do you know there's actually scientific research that says that's the best way to change a habit is not by, I'm going to try my best to stop this, but instead I'm actually going to start this. So Paul has listed here in this passage, and I implore you, please, church, go back, go over, re-read this passage, put off those old things and put on the new ones. Compassion, love, kindness. Let's go back to the first verse. Colossians 3 verse 1, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We have been raised with Christ. Our new life begins when we accept him. The old is gone and the new is here. Did you know that Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth to sacrifice himself, to pay the price that we could never pay ourselves to be right with God again? We don't have time today to go into the whole picture, but right back at the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything was good until sin entered the earth. Then what was required was a sacrifice to maintain atonement with God, a right standing, a right relationship. A sacrifice was required in the form of an unblemished perfect lamb. That lamb was replaced by Jesus on the cross who willingly came, was born into a manger, into humility, was born and into an existence in a time where there was a, a crossroads in the world, was born with the future in mind. And he sacrificed himself to be that perfect, unblemished lamb that pays the price for sin that we could never, ever pay. And I want to encourage anybody who's listening to the sound of my voice today, I want you to, I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment. And it is a prayer accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pledging allegiance to him because he has done it all and created a way for us to be right with God again. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I ask you today to come into my heart and give me a brand new start. All of these old behaviors, I want to put them off. I want to start again, and I can't do it without your help. I'm praying, Lord, that you would help me to put on the new behaviors, the, the way of following you the right way. And I pray today that you would accept my prayer and accept me into your kingdom as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we would love to get in contact with you. We have a Bible that we would love to give you. We have, and I personally would love to um, speak with you and pray with you and connect with you in some way. So why don't you contact us? Thank you, Sam. We have got these Bibles here. Why don't you get in touch with us? Send us an email. Maybe you're not even nearby to Horsham and you're going, oh, I, I prayed that prayer. You know what? We'll mail you one. We will put this out there. We will connect with you. We will chat with you on the phone. We will FaceTime, carry a pigeon, however it looks. We will do whatever it takes to help you take a next step on your journey with Jesus. Amen? Hey, there's one more thing I, I want us to put on. And that this last two weeks have been pretty tough for a lot of people, right? There's people going through it. Some people have lost jobs. Some people feel like they're being forced. Some people have, you know, don't know which way to turn. They actually don't know which way's up. I want to remind everybody today, and this is how we're going to end our service, is that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We have got to stop focusing on the problem and we have got to bring the joy of the Lord into the middle of our situation. He is our strength. He clothes us with joy. So we're going to finish this service a little bit different and there's a fantastic song that we're just going to play. This is going to be the end of the service. I want you to turn it up, get in a worship set, get in a setting, and let's sing this song together. It's called The Joy of the Lord. It's by Dante Bow and Maverick City Music. It's just going to come up on the screens. Hey, but let me pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you, church. We love you heaps.